This is the story of one of Florida's most special natural wonders. Wasissa Slave Canal. Located in Jefferson County, this water course has a remoteness and natural ambiance unlike any other water body in the state. The story begins at the headwaters of the Wasissa River, located just south of the town of Wasissa. Here, at the headwaters, the clear, cold waters of the Florida aquifer bubble up through more than two dozen natural springs. A number of them are clustered around the county park at the headwaters of the river. This is the largest of the springs near the headwaters and is commonly known as Big Blue due to the striking blue color under certain light conditions. It has a reported daily discharge of almost 200 million gallons per day with a year-round temperature of 69 degrees. It's very remote and accessible only by canoe or kayak and is usually populated by one or more alligators and cottonmouth moccasins. Nevertheless, it is still a great attraction for boaters and swimmers. From the headwaters, the Wasissa flows with a swift current through this wide, shallow, and rocky channel bordered by wild rice and pristine wilderness. This stretch of river is especially popular with kayakers. Also, the river is home to wildlife of all varieties, including many alligators. During the Pleistocene age, the availability of water in this area attracted many of the animals of that era, including giant sloths, saber-toothed cats, mastodons, and giant land tortoises. There are several places along the Wasissa where you can still see evidence of such animal life, such as mastodon bones, still visible under the water. And such as this prehistoric bison skull with a broken spear point still sticking in it. As we approach the northern entrance to the Slave Canal, the prominent channel bears to the left. But if you take that route and head into the area locally known as the Jam, reportedly you will never be seen again. But if you do take that route and do make it through, you will end up in a section of the Osceola River known as Half Mile Rise. There is considerable difference in elevation between the Wasissa and Osceola at this latitude. As a result, there are rapids known as the Race, where the channel of the Wasissa falls into the Osceola. Shortly south of this junction, the Osceola goes back underground again to continue its flow toward the Gulf under a land bridge. Although it is better marked today, it is still not rare for paddling enthusiasts to miss the canal entrance and find themselves battling their way through the jam until they hit the race. Then there is confusion when Half Mile Rise disappears underground. Back on the Wasissa, as we approach the northern entrance to the canal, a series of beautiful and apparently natural islands appear to block the main channel of the river. But a Corps of Engineers map from the late 1800s has been found that reveals that these islands are actually the remains of a dam constructed by slaves and early plantation owners during the 19th century in an attempt to divert more water through the canal. The normal channel is to the left over there. Where you can see where it runs into later down into the Osceola River. Construction of the dam was intended to force all of the river's flow into a branch of the river now called the Wasissa Slave Canal. The improvement of the canal was part of an effort by local settlers to create a navigable channel along the Wasissa 
through the Slave Canal and then down the Osceola River to the Gulf, originally for shipping their cotton crop to market and then later for timber harvesting. The settlers formed the Wasissa and Osceola Navigation Company, which contracted local plantation owners for use of their slaves to build a dam as well as to improve the channel. Also, here near the north entrance of the canal, if you know where to look, you can see the submerged decaying remains of a commercial barge, which is evidence of its use for some early commercial shipping through the canal. We are now entering the canal. From this northern beginning, the canal winds southerly through a deep hardwood wetland with significant evidence of Native American occupation along its course. The canal is entirely canopied. In some areas, it is well defined with visible banks. In others, it is impossible, especially in times of high water, to distinguish the channel from the surrounding wetlands. Therefore, it is easy to lose your way. There are typically numerous downed trees across the channel to go under or over, and portaging is often necessary. Therefore, passage through the canal can be a strenuous adventure. At many places along the canal, you can see blocks of limestone bordering the channel, which were dug from the stream by arduous hand labor of the slaves. It's an Indian mound. It's a major Indian mound. Although the canal is named for the improvement work performed by slaves, it has actually been in use by Native Americans for thousands of years. Evidence of this includes a number of Native American mounds found along the canal. One example is the Coon Bottom Mound located near the northern entrance to the canal. Yeah, but this, you can see the excavation there, but uh, there's some remains. There were a lot of shells in there, obviously, and here's some oyster shells, which is truly amazing as far as they would have been brought up from the Gulf. Studies of this mound have found artifacts from 2,000 to 3,000 years ago including a full range of stone tool making material, food preparation waste material, shells and fragmented animal bones, all indicating that the site occupants obtained their food from the river and the surrounding woodlands down to the Gulf Coast. More recently, at least one family was known to live on this mound during the Great Depression with an established house and garden area. This is another mound called Tall Mound, believed to be the tallest along the canal. It stands over two meters in height. While there is evidence of looting on the mound, it has never been subject to a formal archeological dig. In addition to its use by early Native Americans, the canal was also used extensively during the Spanish Mission era. An important role of the Spanish missions was to provide food for the St. Augustine colony and the Spanish fleet. Using Appalachian Native Americans who were experienced farmers and hunters to produce food, the Tokabaga tribe, renowned for their maritime skills, were engaged to serve as their transporters. This illustration depicts the route of the Tokabaga going down the Wasissa and the canal, out of the mouth of the Osceola, then along the Gulf coastline to the Suwannee River, and then up the Suwannee to its junction with the Santa Fe River, where it was transported on to St. Augustine by human backpack. We are now exiting the canal and entering the Osceola River. From this point, the Osceola gradually widens and runs for about five miles to the Gulf of Mexico. Near the mouth of the Osceola, 
The route is especially scenic as the river runs through wide expanses of salt marsh. Despite its long history of usage by humans, the canal today remains a natural wonder. Although a physically challenging venture, a paddling trip through the canal is an almost spiritual experience, especially to anyone aware of its rich history. Anyone knowledgeable of that history cannot but think of paleo hunters traveling through the area in search of chert, for tool making material and weapons, as well as for game. Later use of the area for campsites, ceremonial and burial use. The frequent use of the passage by the Tocobaga for transporting produce and other supplies for the Spanish missions. The backbreaking work performed by slaves during the pre-Civil War era in digging and piling up huge limestone boulders that now line some of the banks the canal. And the subsequent use of the area for trade, subsistence, fishing, and hunting. That rich history cannot but help enhance the natural beauty of the passage.